Tom Leonard couldn't be with us this morning, so I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our New Directions talk and welcoming Philip Long to be with us today. I don't know Philip Long, but I got familiar with his work by reading lots of stuff in Educause about learning space design, and it piqued our interest on the New Directions Coordinating Committee to think about bringing someone who could talk about physical and virtual spaces and their impact or implications for students. Um, I also asked some people, some of our friends in Educational Technology Services, to recommend some of the top speakers, and Philip's name came up on that list. Philip Long is the Associate Director of the Office of Educational Innovation and Technology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has published and presented and served on a range of organizations related to teaching, learning, and technology on topics such as new media, open source applications, immersive learning environments, and virtual worlds. His presentation this morning is called Looking Toward the Horizon, Student Engagement and the Technologies that Support Them. Please join me in welcoming Philip Long. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, it's uh, actually quite a pleasure to be here. These sorts of functions, um, for me at least, are extremely useful because they sort of rip you out of your day-to-day -day fire drill of a life and uh, have a, fo a focusing effect, giving you a chance to sort of assemble some thoughts together that uh, have been rolling around but you hadn't really uh, spent the time and sort of uh, directive energy to uh, to assemble something that is useful um, or or perhaps even possibly coherent. No guarantees about that this time either. Um, uh, I arrived at uh, San Francisco International about 11:30 last night and found that the Bay Bridge was closed. Uh, the, at least the upper deck of it was closed, uh, and spent the next 45 minutes. Um, figuring out how to get onto the lower deck amongst the hordes of other traffic. And then arrived here, of course, to go to the women's faculty club um, and started asking, there were students around at, at, at one o'clock, and, and I did ask them, but they sent me down towards Shattuck. Um, and I realized what, I did have a map, um, and that that was at least the wrong general direction. So um, eventually I made it in, and, um, and finish the talk. <laughs> so uh, we'll see how this goes, but I do appreciate the opportunity to be with you this morning. Um, what I'm gonna try to do is um, three things, really. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about technologies that are on the horizon. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the Horizon Report. Is there anybody, is there a show of hands just to give me an idea? Uh, not that many, interesting. Well, in which case, segue to a promo. Um, the Horizon Report is an annual uh, uh, report that the new, the new Media Consortium puts out to try to identify new technologies that are going to have an impact on teaching, learning, and the creative arts. And it does it in a collective and open process. At the end of this talk, you'll have an invitation to join and be a part of next year's Horizon Report. Um, but it does it through uh, an international group of people on an online wiki site and then a steering group that gets together several times a year with industry, museums, libraries, uh, entertainment, uh, commercial uh, businesses, uh, technology companies, etc. And brainstorms, forecasts, and then picks six things uh, in two in each of three different time horizons to, to try to suggest where things might be heading that we ought to be paying attention to. The three horizons are those things that are that are distributed unequally at the moment but ought to be ubiquitous. Those are the zero to 12 month uh, impacts. There are things in the one to three year range which are out there in some places but deserve merit more consideration and implementation. And then there are the, the blue sky, put your finger in the air and see which way the wind blows, three to five year things that look very promising, have some implementation somewhere, but, um, but lots of things may conspire to either accelerate or derail uh, those kinds of predictions. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about how this relates to a shift from teaching to learning, which I think is one of the pervasive activities that's going on in our institutions at the moment. And then finally, because we're facing a crisis of relevance, I want to talk a little bit about that because I don't know about your students, but, um, but ours certainly, while extremely motivated, um, are, I think, uh, wondering a lot about the kinds of in, uh, learning environments they find themselves in. And I think we're need, we have an issue, particularly uh, at 
the broad majority of schools, perhaps a little bit unlike Berkeley and, and MIT, but the broad majority of schools where this is um, a much more serious concern. So, I'm going to start with some of the um, initial predictions that come out of uh, the Horizon Report work. And some of these are going to look, you're going to look at that and say, well, yeah, that's kind of yesterday's news. Um, but it's not in, the same, in many ways. This is a proliferation of, of tools, the so-called Web 2.0 co-creation tools that do uh, remixes and mashups and self-publication and, and sort of um, remake the traditional model of academic publications and growing with implications for tenure and merit. Um, these are tools that are est relatively established, but what's happening now is they're coming really much more into their own, and we're really starting to understand more thoroughly how we can exploit and use things like RSS and the like uh, for aggregation pages like PageFlakes and the like, which everybody familiar with PageFlakes is one of the common aggregators. Um, PageFlakes is a tool, well, let's see whether, we'll see whether this thing works. Uh, where's my cursor? There we are. Um, And let me just see if I get uh, page flakes. This is where the com. There is something happening behind the scenes. Don't worry. There we go. So page flakes just basically gives you a little portal. Um, a little portal to uh, allow you to pick and personalize a web page by ad identifying RSS feeds that you'd like to have from whatever source it is. And then you can identify where we're moving towards that is the ability to selectively filter the RSS feeds by topic or area that go into each of the little portlets that you, that you create. It's done on the fly. It's one of the many wonderful web resources that are available at no charge. And um, and allows you to create, for example, for a class, a specific page that's related to a topic area. And you can have news feeds. You can have industry information. You can have feeds from various blogs that you happen to like that, um, that populate that page and have a kind of a customized resource for what you're interested in seeing and doing. OK. Um, a second area that's moving rapidly forward is this notion of collaboration webs. Collaboration webs really are um, taking what we've usually done with uh, sets of tools on the desktop and putting them out into the cloud. So things like Office Suites that are now in the cloud, Google Docs is an obvious example. A more recent entry is Zoho. Um, Adobe is going to be coming out with something in their Air environment called Buzzword. Is that a familiar topic? Or Buzzword is essential. Air is the Adobe um, uh, runtime environment, which allows you to create. Um, applications which have a, a desktop GUI kind of feel to them and can be delivered inside a browser if you wish, but the interesting thing about them is they can be delivered directly on your desktop without the browser and uh, as long as you're connected to the network and behave like a desktop app typically does. Um, so there's a lot of little things out there. If you're a Twitter fan, then there's a thing called Snitter, which is um, an Air application that allows you to have that little widget on your desktop. Uh, and so you'll have much richer um, uh, user interfaces for these kinds of tools. The big complaint that most people have with things like Google Docs is, is it looks pretty primitive. It doesn't give you pagination. It doesn't give you kind of the basic things you expect in a regular word processor that you get off your hard disk. But um, that's going to be certainly changing shortly. Multimedia authoring online is now the next sort of rage in this area. Things like Splash Up and other tools allow you to actually do what you would have done perhaps in a, uh, in a Photoshop environment or something like that on your desktop. Now these tools are accessible for free on the web to allow you to manipulate uh, documents and, or um, images in that fashion. And these things are now being integrated with social networks and data feeds um, so that you bring the RSS into these environments and have the collaboration around something that's shared. A third area that I think is uh, moving rapidly uh, is the area of mobile broadband. And this is simply taking the bandwidth that you expect from your, from your wall connection or from your, wired connect, your, your wireless connection and your Wi-Fi area and moving them onto a desktop or handheld device that can be useful. This is a project going on with the Sensible City uh, group, um, which is taking advantage of um, placing and leveraging handheld devices, in this case GPSs, on mobile phones in the city of Rome. And what you'll see here is a map 
uh, with a timeline at the bottom, and then events, and they're actually recording in real time where individuals are going with relation to events happening in the city, and mapping those activities to see how the city's facilities, transportation, uh, restaurant areas, uh, various things are being used in real time. And of course, these are also being presented in the city of Rome on large screens in, the, in town so that the people who are with walking around and doing this are seeing the data in real time as their participation influences it. Um, and so there's an opportunity from this to get an idea. You see on the right side there, the, the event uh, Madonna concert happened to be going on. And so uh, people were happened to be drawn to that who, who were participating in this particular project. We're using that uh, on our campus, for example, to give you an idea of where the digital footprints of our students are wandering. So we have, our routers are telling us every 15 minutes uh, where IP connections are. And uh, we map that in a three-dimensional three model on top of the, of the campus map. And from that, we see the sort of undulating cloud of movement across the 24-hour cycle of where students are, where they're working. So for example, if you decide to take a hallway and you want to add some places to sit and maybe a screen on the wall and you want to see whether or not there's an impact on student use, um, you can watch the map. And you'll see the aggregations of individuals as they gather around this for periods of time and when they're doing it. Um, we, students can opt in and identify themselves and individually, not as you know, Joe Blow at, at MIT, but rather as a, as a unique identifier on their particular IP signature so that we can actually track individuals if they wish to allow that. Students do that amongst themselves so that they can use it to do things like um, uh, identify within a small group of their friends where they are so they can go on the map and they can see if they've if they permitted someone to allow their, no, their location to be seen, they'll, they'll be identified on the map and they can be therefore IM'd and said, you know, what happens, we're three blocks apart, you want to get together for coffee kind of thing. So to increase the, the probability of uh, ad hoc interactions. Mm -hmm. And this is also allowing for some interesting art. Um, there is a map that's going to be up shortly um, that looks at the outbound IP traffic from one of the large gateways in New York City. And they're using it to identify where in the world these outbound pipes are sending communications to, and then mapping it uh, so that you have a sort of a dynamic city uh, world interaction map that's going on. Um, and that's more from the aesthetic. I don't think there's actual particular interest since the, most of the telecoms already know where their traffic is going. But the mechanisms for representing it and things are opening up sort of different ideas about how to take advantage of this from a visual perspective. Data mashups are another major area of interest. Uh, how many of you played, have played with many eyes from IBM? Not too many. Okay, so you should do this. Take a look at that. The, the, uh, the system or the tool is called Many Eyes. It is a way of doing with data what mashups have been doing with geo geographical information and images. Uh, you can give it data sets of various sorts and then have a number of different visualization tools to compare things. Um, Ted Riesling, um, or excuse me, Hans Riesling from the TED Talks, um, if you've seen those uh, presentations, um, Hans Riesling is a researcher at the Karolinska Institute of Medicine um, and developed a set of visualization tools for looking at uh, health data around the world from databases that are public, publicly available from UNESCO. Um, and what those tools have done were sufficiently exciting that Google, of course, bought them. Um, and now they're incorporated into the next generation of some of Google tools. But if you have a chance, you should go to look at, at uh, his, uh, Hans Riesling's video on the TED Talks site, because it is, it's extraordinary. In his particular case, um, he has animated the, uh, the uh, one of the things he's presented is an animation of the video uh, showing um, family size and mortality, in, uh, fam uh, individual mortality by country. And of course, he talks about this. He, when he first talks about it, he talked about being a faculty member at Karolinska and, and, and wondering whether or not a talk about uh, health statistics and, and population demographics and such was really going to be informative to the students. And so he gave them a survey and literally asked them to rank a series of countries by infant mortality. And what he found, he six questions, and he, he gave the students the survey, and he found that essentially half the students got the ordering wrong. 
and he was very encouraged by that because he thought, you know, an old guy has something to teach uh, to his students. Um, he also gave the same survey to the faculty, and they also got about half wrong. And then it finally dawned on him that what he was really under, uh, uncovering was the fact that um, a troop of chimps would have done equally well relative to the faculty and students because they would have gotten half wrong, uh, guessing by which banana to grab around the answers. So uh, he starts with that, and he animates this data in a very, uh, very impactful way. You see how this, these kinds of assumptions, in fact, are, uh, are often incorrect. In this particular case, we took the last five years' worth of new, of new Media Consortium reports and y uploaded the actual text and did a, and did a, uh, a tag map of the, imp of the occurrence of various words. And it's very it's actually useful because you can see over five years, we've been doing this now for f five years, I guess, and you can see the various kinds of, of topic areas um, as they appear in the, those particular years. And we've done it by year by year and then combined the two together. And you end up with things like that little inset there where you see social, social networking and teaching and creative expression and augmented reality, collective intelligence, and various other things sort of start to stand out. And in fact, and hopefully so, those are, are the current sets of, of issues um, du jour, so to speak, um, that are important uh, in these, uh, these collections of, of uh, investigations. So it seems like these are, are, are useful tools. This idea of mashing up data then is becoming a particularly valuable, um, valuable resource. A little bit further out is something that we've already experienced in, the, in a big way to get together with things like Wikipedia, but this notion of collective intelligence. And in particular, emerging of uh, the use of these things for th stuff like prediction markets. I don't know if you've probably f Maybe you haven't. There's an interesting prediction market uh, that has been looking at uh, presidential uh, nominations and, uh, and winners over the last several years run out of Iowa. They have been completely and 100% accurate over the last several years. So you might want to look at the current information that comes from them. Um, let's see if I can get my cursor back. Is that? No. Um, these are. Prediction markets are simply leveraging the community out there, the, the mass of individuals on the internet, to essentially weigh in by, um, by voting, by buying shares in outcomes of particular events and a structured model behind doing so. And so they can be useful for identifying products that might be a potentially valuable in, in test marketing. They can be used for identifying social directions and political events and potentially uses of technology and or um, uh, activities in classes, depending on the audience you're addressing and the framework by which you're presenting the questions. Collective intelligence is also behind the largest sort of public database out there, Freebase, which is essentially um, a database that you can create and add data to um, with uh, categories and, um, and indices and the like variables of your choice. And it collectively adds from all of the different participants around the world who are in fact putting their data into these environments. Um, and Wikipedia, which started all of this off, is relevant here not for the creation of the, the actual product, but for the process that it reveals. Um, and that's really the, the value, at least that I find in the courses that I teach. Um, students are less aware, it seems, of um, the use of the wiki as a, um, as a uh, revision management environment and uh, going into the wiki to see how changes have been made and the volatility of those changes and the notations associated with those changes in some sense is a way of extracting out the, the argument and the discursive process that leads to a consensus building around the topic. In some way it makes visible what's going on in a scholarly way amongst individuals. And so if you pick a, a topic which is relatively controversial and you then go into it and look at its, uh, its, at its revision history and the notes around it, it can be an extraordinarily useful way of bringing to attention the activity of scholarship that is not necessarily present in the presentation of the final product of the wiki page. Social operatings, operating systems are now starting to uh, emerge, and that's the notion of operating systems that take into account the individuals who are participating together and something about their relationships. Yahoo, in their 
uh, brief uh, description of Yahoo Life um, is sort of playing around with this in a research context, um, which is a semantic web or organized uh, set of, re of tools that's derived around email. And perhaps one of the more interesting one is to think about this. I mean, email really is the glue among social relationships in many ways these days. Um, and there are extraordinary, um, extraordinarily useful and valuable things that you can de uh, derive from understanding the relationships among individuals working on a topic. Um, Intel, for example, not too long ago, tried to build a knowledge base to capture information that um, was relevant, was resident in their research communities sprung all over the world. And they did, you know, what you typically might think of. They got together, they made this design, they came up with this tagging meta -ta a scheme to go with things for, for taking ideas and relating them together, et cetera. And their idea was that they wanted to take the, the findings and the, the hard-earned knowledge that individuals had, had garnered in a fab plant somewhere in Southeast Asia and surface that. So if somebody was in a fab plant someplace else and was running into a problem, they could search this and perhaps get a clue as to what was going on. And that makes perfect sense. And it was a complete and utter failure. Uh, and it was a failure because everybody sent this information back and forth to one another in email. And the extra effort to try to, to go to this other thing, and many of you are probably more familiar with this than many, um, to try to take the structured way of organizing this data and providing a mechanism for discovering it and, and retrieving it was absolutely uh, the straw that broke the camel's back. And it was just it was a disaster. So what they did was they integrated into Outlook their knowledge base client. So it actually sampled the headers of email messages, and, y and then all you had to do was say, this is for the knowledge base with a tag. And it pulled that information together to start to build this stuff. With that in mind, there's a company called Zopni, which is inbox spelled backwards which has uh, begun mining these kinds of things for individuals' emails. Um, essentially what they're doing is, is they're, they're examining your, your, your connections, the, the individuals whom you write emails to, when you send the emails, the time the individuals you sent emails take in responding to you, um, the connections in their CC lists, to see who their email was also sent to to develop relationship networks and coming up with a way of, of identifying how the, your connections are mapped across the world. So you have this little profile you see at the top of an individual who is actually sending a message to somebody else. It noted in, it scanned the actual content of the message, found that there was an actual phone number, extracted that out and stuck it into the, to your, to your personal uh, directory so that you had that information. And then when the individual sent messages back and such, and you immediately see, for example, that there are certain times of the day that it's probably unusual un, and un, not worthwhile expecting a response, um, and other times when it's probably more likely. It also has uh, information about everything that was attached in any of the email messages to send to those individuals. So you have the aggregation of what was sent by objects. So that if you were thinking about, well, I know I sent an attachment to so-and-so, instead of scanning through your inbox to find something, you just go to the list of stuff that ever, was ever sent by that by or to that individual and have a much more um, direct way to get what you're looking for. And finally, and finally, <laughs> There we go. Um, you can map this in various ways to give you some analytics to tell you the, the pattern of your communications with these individuals. Unfortunately for people like me, it's only um, available for Outlook at the moment. Uh, but you can download it today from Zobni and, and, uh, and amaze your friends and colleagues about um, their responsiveness or lack thereof to your missives. Um, but it is informative in the sense that it's mining which, with the relationships amongst each other. And you can see the sort of transition to this towards the use of tools and how you interact with individuals around those tools. And that's where I want to go next um, in talking about interoperability and this notion of tools and tools talking to one another. I'm being a little bit anthropomorphic, but, but bear with me. Because what's starting to move forward right now is this, this major issue that we're all confronting, where we've got all of these useful tools that sit on our desktops, and 
in a sense they are independent of one another for all practical purposes, and yet there's information going on in their use that um, different tools would find valuable and which you would find valuable if they were in fact uh, alerting each other to these exchanges. If there was some sort of messaging environment going on behind the scenes, that when you sent an email, um, realized that that email also perhaps had a question, perhaps a quiz question, because perhaps the email was to a class list and in it was a quiz. And that the responses to that email, in fact, are responses to the quiz, and that ought to go to your quizzing tool. Instead of having to go into your email and then cut and paste it over, or get out of your email because you thought about sending this quiz when you were writing to somebody, start up the, the quizzing client, re-enter re -enter everything, and then associate that with the group, send that all out. You can see where having these kinds of, of communications laterally would be valuable. And we're, we're moving at this point in this area in sort of two directions. One is continuing to enable the cloud uh, of desktop, of applications, a la Google Docs and the, and the like, to talk to one another. And things like Open Social, the, um, the, open, the API that Google has been sponsoring to get these lightweight tools to talk to one another more directly by creating APIs where they can interact. Or Yahoo Pipes is another example of this. Those are sort of moving forward um, Microsoft is moving forward th with this using their Silverlight environment, and of course o Adobe with its Air environment. Uh, and so that's the sort of the space that's going on in the cloud area. But there's also the opportunity to do something similar on the desktop. And so let me just do a slight segue for a minute here on this notion. Uh, because we used to think that browsers are really the all-in-one application and that was the path towards sustainability and delivering educational tools and such to our students. That these were uh, the least common denominator for, for a commonality amongst, uh, amongst our communities and that um, they, they do limit or, or a user choice and they, and they have this sort of unfortunate side effect is that the tools that you kind of come to expect from your desktop are not available to you when you're doing educational tools. You sort of move over into Sakai or you move over into Blackboard or you move over into whatever the environment is that's been designated as the environment for doing this teaching thing. And all of the things that you've done up till now sort of become ancillary. And that, to some extent, is a one-source-fits-all fit, kind of environment that you are, argue for usually around supportability means, right? You think, well, this is the way in which we can manage this for large numbers of individuals. But, of course, students and faculty come to campus with a variety of computing environments they already know about and how to use them and how to leverage them to more or less extent. Um, most of these users are capable, at least uh, at, a, at a certain level, of, of supporting themselves with those tools that they've become familiar with. That's increasingly true with each younger generation that we find. And even new generations of operating systems are getting a little bit easier to work with. Ubuntu and the, in, on the Unix side or Linux side, uh, Mac OS on the, on the desktop side are two examples of that. In higher ed, however, um, we build sort of things separately. The industry goes out and builds all these wonderful tools and, and does things for the sort of consumer market. And then we go out and build things for the teaching and learning market and find ourselves usually at the short end of the stick uh, as the consumer market b moves ahead rapidly with uh, inv invention and innovation and distribution and testing and on they go. And we sort of labor along to try to get our tools to fit into whatever environment we've decided is our framework. Um, so we have this issue of lower rates of evolution happening in the mainstream community relative to the education community. And I think a reasonable goal is to try to reduce that separation, to leverage that innovation and bring that sort of activity back together. So simplicity is a key issue here. Um, these complex all-in-one solutions are getting more and more difficult. I don't know how many of you have used all of the functions of Office. Um, but I still haven't figured out all of the functions of Office, and, um, and now they've changed file formats on us, and so once again, we have another set of issues to deal with, and I find myself moving to simpler things. I find myself using um, the OS 10 Pages uh, application because it's a little bit more straightforward, or I just go to Zoho and I use theirs because I'm going to be sharing it anyway, and it gets most of what I need to have done done. 
So the notion here is that if we could have a pick and choose kind of environment, that will likely be a more, in the end at least, uh, sustainable and usable environment than making that one massive choice of we're gonna do this and by God, it, it all better fit together. So continuing a little bit more on this theme, um, there is this myth that web applications are easier to integrate and support. Um, and I say it's a myth because in fact, um, there are lots of inconsistencies in user interface design when it comes to web apps. I know you have Fluid working here trying as a project, trying to address those kind of standardiz standardizations, particularly from an accessibility point of view, and hopefully that will make progress. But it's still um, an area of contention and divergence. It's also a myth that there's application integration easier in these all-in-ones in environments, and I don't know how many of you have been watching the evolution of tools in Sakai, for example. It doesn't seem to be an easy task to build new Sakai tools and put them into, into place. Um, the web, in fact, can't communicate easily across multiple providers or service environments, and that is an issue if you're trying to take advantage of these things. And finally, there's this notion that, well, it's a web app, it's easy to build. But then you've got um, a web app that has to work for three or four flavors of browsers and three or four release levels and different operating systems on top of that. And by the end of the day, it's not exactly as easy as you thought. So let me just skip past this because um, I don't think we really need to talk. This is a, um, I was discussing this with a, by a bunch of developers recently, and these are kind of the, some of the major talk uh, components. But I do want to talk about this notion of control in terms of who owns this stuff. Um, we typically bounce from one website to another, and we use that to do mashups and portals and various sorts of things. Um, and yet the ability to do that requires a service environment and a project group that can put these things together so that it enables us to do that. Desktop tools, if they're built right, allow the users to install and connect them themselves. Uh, and built right, I guess, is the, the magic words here. This is also important in today's multi-campus environment. Uh, imagine in our case, for example, a student at MIT is taking a class at MIT, but they also happen to be taking a class at that finishing school down the road. Um, and also a class at, at uh, National University of Singapore through the MIT Singapore Alliance project. And they want to work with the tools equally in those environments. And yet, what do we do? We force an MIT student to get a Kerberos ID so they can access the tools on our particular campus. And then they get a Harvard ID so they access the tools to their particular campus. And then we negotiate with the folks down in, in Singapore to see what they can access there. And some of the times it works and most of the times it doesn't so well. And this is, a, this is an issue. Uh, it's an issue as well within campuses. In the, here in the California State University model, you have different campuses that have made different choices about environments. It's one system by name or brand, but it's certainly not one system by tool environment and opportunities for students to work in it. So there's faced with, students are faced with these overlapping environments. Moving amongst them is difficult. And we end up with this sort of traditional notion of the campus with various environments and this sort of this separation to the web and email and the like and internet apps sitting out there when what we want is the ability to intermix both living and learning with the tools that are relevant in, in the individual's user control. So there isn't this loss of focus and loss of focus around the individual or the faculty member being able to make make the choices for how they approach learning with the tools that they think are useful to them. So how might we move forward with this? Well, there's a project that's being kicked off shortly um, that's kind of the working title is LMS on the desktop. And the idea is to try to look at these things and figure out what sorts of interactions ought to exist amongst these sorts of tools so that you can have them messaging and listening to each other and you can have them, in fact, interoperating. So, Functionality comparisons like this uh, are in part of this process. So you have things like lecture capture and scheduling and, uh, and chat and forums. These are all things that are typically done on a system-wide basis or a, a, large, a large integrated system basis. And you have the corresponding desktop side of those things. At this point, just looking at it from an Apple perspective to have a point of reference, but it's not necessarily meant to be Apple-centric. So you have things like Podcast Producer and iCal and iChat and forums and mail apps and iQuiz and various things that you can do on your desktop that allow you to do what these larger systems do, but allow you to do it within the sense of you're having control and, and direction over it. 
Okay. So this particular aside is related to this notion of returning, in some sense, um, a focus back on the individuals, the users, the students for their learning environment. Marshall McLuhan has said that we look at the present through a rear view mirror and we march backwards into the future. And we're doing that in increasing speed uh, these days. Um, one of the artifacts of this, interestingly, is starting to be more attentive to the things that we engage with in, the, in this march. Um, the, all the bits and pieces of, of, of intellectual output that we produce, um, what many people have called you know, their life bits, um, and uh, there's a fellow, Gordon Bell, at Microsoft, for example, who's been recording everything that he does, every email he sends, every, every interaction he has, anything, and organizing it together in some fashion in some massive personal life portfolio. And in fact, we're starting to think about things like that from a student's perspective. We already have portfolio thinking going on in this institutional assessment, and we have portfolios for different course types of things. But those are, in some sense, inverted in that the locus of control, once again, is not around the individual who's the creator of it, but around some organizing principle external to them that is using it for their own purposes, whether it's assessment or whether it's accreditation or whatever it might be. And we need to think about turning this on its hand, once again, to enable the student or the individual to remain the focus. And this is a focusing issue on, I think, what is the primary concern we have these days. And that's sort of an example of a shot of a student and lecture, uh, which is not terribly uh, unrealistic. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the work of Mike Wesch and the University of Kansas? Handful of heads. So you've seen his, um, his uh, sort of exercises, so to speak. Um, I was going to play the, his, his latest little video clip, but I don't know whether everybody has already seen it, and I'm not sure whether it's... Can I get a show of hands? This is audience participation time. Have you seen it, or would you... So a handful. How many would like to see it? Okay, so, hop, you're voted down. All right. All right, so let me just pop out and um, bring this to a browser. Okay, where's my... There we are. Oh, I can, oh, I can do it there. Good. So we want to go to YouTube. Oops, can't type backwards, huh? You YouTube.com. Wait a minute. Oh, I'm in the wrong <laughs> wrong window. There we go. So this, I'm in fact doing this in part. Uh, can I actually get all of this on the screen here? The Machine Is Us is the other one that he's got uh, out for a had out for a while. That's not the one we want. The one we want is a vision of students today. Yeah, I'm just trying to find my cursor. Where my cursor? Where did my cursor go? Ah, there we go. Mike teaches a cultural anthropology class. He spends about a quarter of his time in Papua New Guinea um, with communities um, studying non-verbal, uh, pre-verbal um, uh, primitive cultures. And this is his classroom at the University of Kansas. And this was a project he did in collection with his students. There's about 250 in the class.
Yeah, it's good. Probably. So, he's uh, continuing this, this work. I think the important thing to note is, um, is that there are, I, these are students who um, today are like this. They are looking for relevance, they're overscheduled, they're socially hyperconnected, and they're educationally largely disconnected. They walk around with stuff like this in their pockets, which we do very little to leverage from any kind of academic learning perspective. Um, they're on, but they're highly, but they are useful for the students themselves and individuals to connect and close with each other. I mean, this is still a vision worth working with. Do you remember the Network Navigator video? This is from 1988, right, from Apple? This was um, an attempt before there was anything from Apple on a notebook to show what an Apple notebook or what a notebook might ought to look like. And I'm not going to play it other than just this little introductory sequence. And the reason that my, this is supposed to be an office here at Berkeley. Okay, this is a typical faculty office. Notice the, the upper part there, you know, the coffee machine off to the side. Boy, did I want to go to Berkeley. Of course, he's interacting with the computer verbally. And, a, and his avatar is responding to him. Nice birthday party next Sunday. Today you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. Going through his schedule. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 4.15 on deforestation in the Amazon And of course, range. the whole rest of the video is right. about the fact that he hasn't really prepared for this lecture, and he's going to try to rope in a colleague at another institution to try to do the lecture for him via a video link uh, that's done. Um, but the vision of that particular piece is extraordinarily prescient. I mean, it really is. And a lot of the interface tools and such we're only starting to get to right now. But what these tools can do is return to us this notion of a scalable apprenticeship that allows us to reconnect with students. The technology has the ability to enable us to capture learning power <laughs> and do so in a way that's much more intimate than ever we could before. Um, there is a number of experiments going on all over the country. I just want to recognize two very quickly. One is a course 6001. Oh, well, it used to be called 6001. It was the signature introductory computer science course at MIT. About 650 or so students would take it as freshmen. Um, it has been wildly uh, w well received. It's the textbook for it's in 142 languages. There's a peer instruction system built around it with extraordinary problem sets. And they've thrown it out. And they've thrown it out to try to leverage these technologies in a more intimate way by teaching with a peer instruction model mobilized around teams of four students and one mentor per team. Okay? So think about that. One mentor, TA, faculty, whatever, per four students. Um, they have in, uh, developed this model of TAs, LAs, learning assistants, which are upper division paid undergra undergraduates. And then the twist in the model is GLAs, which are guest learning assistants. Guest learning assistants are students in the class that are taking it currently who can volunteer to teach the class, or at least the lab section, twice during the course of the term. And they come to class on a Wednesday night and get three hours of intensive instruction on the lab assignment that they're going to teach as a mentor the following day. And that's what's going on as we speak. Um, these are students that are essentially going through the lab exercise in an intense way with faculty and, 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 and TAs the night before for three hours and then acting as mentors and facilitators for the other students who are walking into it for the first time. Um, this is sort of leveraging the engineering mantra of fail early and often. The idea is you want to fail, that's a learning opportunity, but you don't want to fail with the catastrophic last project of the class on which 60% of your grade depends. And the focus is on, on the out, uh, less on the outcome and more on the, the method, the process, the discovery that goes on in the individual small projects that are happening. So here are images, all the faculty, guest LAs and TAs wear these crazy hats, pirate hats, wizard hats, etc., and they're in this massive room in groups of four uh, where they are, in fact, these were taken with my cell phone two days ago, 
um, because we are just sort of figuring it out as we go, and the faculty will tell you that they have no clue how this is going to work. The, the, the learning environment is Python. They're learning to code, but they're learning to code by controlling robots. So each, each group has a little robot, like this one, that their code has to operate on, that they have to deal with, okay? Similarly, we're starting to do lots of project-based uh, project course, based courses at the freshman year. This is one on microscale engineering, where a group of 12 students are working in microfluidics to look at the interactions of cells as they come through and are, and are mixed together. They're looking at it because they want to try to understand the dynamics of HIV, um, of drug interactions with cell surfaces. This is a freshman class, and they have individual workstations with microscopes on top of cameras and little microfluidics chambers that they have physically built themselves and are now going through the process of trying to understand how this might affect the mediation of drug uh, regimens for HIV students. And finally, this notion of bringing remote laboratory environments into uh, the classroom in a way that's more tangible. MIT has the benefit or the curse, depending on your perspective, of having a nuclear reactor on campus. This is the reactor. Um, what we are able to do is bring that reactor to the desktop. In the right-hand lower corner there, you see a remote application that actually controls a neutron spectroscopy experiment that's running in the containment facility. That's an animation of the experiment. You see the neutrons that are coming out of the chopper and then go being detected by the, by the sensor at the, at the for front of that. And then as the sensor moves back, there's further distance to travel. The different energy levels of the neutrons then can spread out, and you get to see the different energy levels in the spectrum of, of energies associated with the neutrons. And the students are manipulating this, including moving the device back and forth, putting um, various absorption agents in front of it so they can look at nuclear absorption from their desktops. And depending on the lesson plan, this could be used for physics first and ninth grade. This could be used for high school senior physics class. This could be used for introduction. This can be used for research. So these emerging technologies can bring these apprenticeship opportunities together. Uh, we saw how Mike Wesch was, was suggesting that um, these things can, in fact, uh, be impactful for students. And he actually raised the question. He asked students to raise their hand. How many students enjoyed, uh, look forward to coming to class? And less than half raised their hands. He asked how many students enjoyed or look forward to learning. And they all raised their hands. So we have an opportunity here to take and let me just go back here, to take what is a normally inquisitive, naturally um, discovery-oriented human being and, and through these possibilities pr preserve and enhance that as opposed to doing what, what, the, uh, what the NAACP used to say, which is the, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. And we're doing that on a daily basis that we have to be attentive to. Every talk I give, I try to give a picture of my granddaughter in the talk, so, <laughs> so I've been successful this time around. I'd like to invite you to participate in the next round of the New Media Consortium activities. Go to www.nmc.org slash horizon. You'll see the last five reports. They're freely accessible and available as a PDF. We generally kick off in September. Um, there will be a large wiki site set up for you to be participating and suggesting your ideas for technologies to put to consider. And then there's a modified Delphi process for selecting and weaning out those technologies based on a series of filtering questions, which are up on that website as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Now, this is the time that everybody goes, oh, God, what am I going to say? <laughs> the back? Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Paul Hamburg, and I'm the librarian for the Judaic Club. This was an incredible presentation. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One is that it seems, especially in the earlier part of the program, most of the sites that you talked about were aggregating data about individuals, but you didn't seem to talk much about privacy issues and about how people uh, interact with them and what, what other people can know about you that you might not want people to know about right. you. And where, where if at all, 
there is a lie about that issue. The other one is that a lot of the sites, fascinating as they are, uh, deal with courses in the sciences and a little bit in the social sciences. How is technology being used in terms of what you've been seeing uh, for instruction in the humanities? Okay. Um, the first question, the first part uh, of, the, of the question is around the um, amount of information that is being exchanged um, in the examples that were given in this talk um, and issues of um, privacy and, uh, and um, uh, discovery that the individual may wish to have in a much tighter control on their, on their own as opposed to um, have it be aggregated in various sort of anonymous ways or, or not so anonymous ways uh, on their behalf. Um, I think that is a significant issue, and one of the things I think ne that is essential is if this, the, the theme, one of the themes of this talk is trying to return the focus on the individual, the learner, the student, or the faculty member, that includes the individual and the learner, the student, the faculty member's option and choice about what they disclose. So for example, in the, um, in the project at MIT where I was mentioning that there is tracking going on of, of activity across the access points on the wireless network. Um, that is a project where the actual focus of the project is on a user selectable profile of what they wish to show and disclose uh, about their presence on the net. And the real research behind that is, is the issue of how you make sure that that part of it is, retains sort of the central pervasive focus and you can elect when you want to see your, your, um, your trans transversing of the campus and the IP tracking of that, when you want that to be visible and when you don't. You can elect when you want to make yourself aware to whom you wish to make yourself aware, uh, uh, no, uh, known to, et cetera. So I couldn't agree with you more that that, that is something that requires uh, vigilance and attention and uh, investment to those organizations which are trying to make a statement and or do work around that, whether that's EFF or whatever it happens to be, um, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, those are sorts of things that I think that are important. Similarly, when it comes to content and its dissemin dissemination and the like, Creative Commons, as you're well aware, is, is in that space, Science Commons and the science side of data. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's going on that uh, I described that is being harvested by virtue of the fact that the tools themselves are n not in any way um, built to have a individual user profile selecting what they show and what they don't. That is an issue that I think we collectively have to get at. Uh, the second question that you asked was, lots of my examples are from sciences and, and technology oriented courses. Um, that's unfortunately or not the bias that I have given where I come from, um, which is I would be, uh, roundly sanctioned if I didn't say we do have a social sciences and humanities set of programs and they are active and vibrant and alive. Um, and I chose the science ones mostly because it's my familiarity so that's my, my um, limitation in that sense. Uh, there are remarkable things going on in the humanities. One that uh, comes to mind is, a, is an international project on conflict resolution and um, it is taking advantage of these kinds of social networking tools and video sharing and collaborative annotation tools to allow different views of what conflict means in different cultures to be expressed. Um, there's also lots of uh, examples in uh, foreign languages and literature where uh, projects are being done where students are asked a simple question about um, uh, describe something that's important in your household or in your family. And the students in the class are from multiple places around the world and the differences about what they select and how they articulate what's important are obviously useful uh, windows into both culture and personal values and such which vary um, among those communities and are being done in, in uh, online sites um, of the sort that we were describing. I think, in fact, if I had to make a guess, that there is more going on in the humanities and social sciences and that's in that arena than there are in the sciences, which is, tends to be why I tend to bias towards the sciences, because we, as scientists, tend to o o omit or, or look past those things, um, where, in fact, they are extremely important and relevant. Any other questions? Yes.
time to do the work that they need to do. It will be terrific. 26 and a half hours per day. We find, you know, how do we keep up with all of the stuff that's coming out and learning how to use it and applying the way so we actually have some contact? We seem to be spending more and more time trying to keep up with all this stuff that's continuing to evolve and it's not going to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll, I'll reiterate the comment for the record, and that is 26 years ago, time was the most limiting factor for faculty and students. Today, time is the most limiting factor for faculty and students, and it's gotten worse. Um, just to respond to the, to the observation, I mean, there's you know, the flippant response, of course, is there, there's 24 hours a day, and if that's not enough, you can work nights. Um, <laughs> The, the reality, though, is, is that I think there are things. You know, the Horizon Report, one of its virtues is there's a group of people who care about these things, and you can leverage. You don't have to participate. You can simply take advantage. Um, so that's the ability to sort of select where to attend to so that that part of, of an activity or area of interest that you have um, can be delegated is a useful thing. Um, the other th the thing I guess I would argue is that, is that um, one of the things that we have before us is a sort of tug of war between content and, uh, or coverage and content, right? And um, we're increasingly finding, I think, that um, the how of what we're doing the learning to learn, the process of thinking, the process of framing questions is the thing that we need to teach more and more of, and that the individual bits and bytes of the particular moment today that are topically um, part of the, cor of the corpus of knowledge for this particular subject is less and less what we have to convey. And I think there, ought, there is an opportunity here um, to try to keep pushing that a little bit. Not to say that there aren't areas of fundamental requirements in different disciplines where you just have to belly up to the bar and do it. Uh, whether that's in mathematics or in various, there's certain fundamentals you can't say, well, I'll, I'll deal with that theorem later. You, know. um, you, you just need to have some of these things in advance. And in many ways, the only way to get it is the persistent cons and, and uh, con and uh, uh, s focused long-term attention in a singular sort of narrative way on the topic. Uh, we have to make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and suggest that all things are just in time relevant. Um, but we can, and I think we need to think about the process activities and the other attributes that these different learning uh, challenges to time are affording in this process. So this active learning and studio <laughs> physics, for example, um, you can't really cover everything you can in the chaos of a studio physics class, and that's okay. Um, because they're learning a lot more about the topics that they are covering and they're learning how to learn the parts that they aren't. And we need to keep pursuing that so that we can do a better job of constraining that time group, time creep. Yes? Uh, thank you. It was a very interesting talk. My name is Lynn Jones and I'm a librarian in the teaching uh, division of the library. Um, many new tools that you brought up were, were fascinating. I'd like to follow up with the, the idea that most grabbed my attention that I scribbled the fastest was the scalable apprenticeship idea. It's not a technology-based idea. It's a structure method. Maybe that's because that's what I do. But that seemed to me like, whoa, I could do that, or we could do that. And, and it reminded me of Mike Wesh um, video, which was so beautifully done. I was just, you know, cinematography. It was great. Yeah. But that also was not really about technology. It was really about student engagement with content. Right. And so it, it's interesting to me that while your talk was mostly about, you know, gizmos and gadgets and applications, the two things that maybe were the most compelling were those two those two well, w w technology done right is invisible. I mean, it's like, uh, at least from my perspective, um, and it, it, they are enablers um, that uh, that extend the mind. Um, 
So when it comes to some of these active learning approaches, there's a combination of pedagogy, there's a combination of built spaces to enable those pedagogies, and there is a layering of the tools that can be effective and useful in allowing the students to take charge of their discovery and learning in a particular uh, discipline area. Sure. So to reiterate for the mic, you, the comment was that um, of all the talks on the various techno, techno gizmos that were presented, um, the pedagogy of engagement and scalable apprenticeship was one of the topics that was most um, impactful. And, um, and to talk a bit more about uh, technology-enabled learning spaces. I think in the issue of technology-enabled learning spaces, one of the things that we're l discovering is that there are families of technologies that match collective, collective approaches to different types of teaching. And that those things um, effectively need to be uh, aligned. And then rather than build spaces for all things or what we have done in the past, um, that is to say, you know, th at one point the sort of the model was the black box, the the black box theater, right? You had the space, and you could do anything with it given the right technology and stuff. And what we find, I think, is that those spaces are uh, mediocre for all and good at nothing. Um, and and that's an issue for us. Um, if you interview and talk to faculty teaching any of these sorts of project-based courses or any of these highly interactive discovery-oriented courses, um, there are certain things that stand out. They need spaces for um, uh, disc these spaces for practice and presentation. That there's places that w there are times in the course of these activities when the students need as a team or individually to present findings back to their teammates or to the collect to the collective, and there ought to be spaces that are optimized for doing that well. We we know that there are times and places where performance is the key overriding issue. And in higher education, that's usually called lecture. Um, but that is a performance space. And you're not going to, and there are various techniques for trying to get more interactivity. I mean, Eric Mazur has peer instruction tool techniques for trying to make lectures more interactive and such. But the truth is, is that if you've got 400 to 700 people in a large space, you're not going to ask and sit around and say, OK, now let's break into groups, <laughs> right? It, it just doesn't make sense. But you can optimize it for what it is built for. You also find that there is an awful lot of need for small team interaction and group space, which doesn't bleed one onto another. If you imagine there are about four or five sets of things, of, of spatial interactions that match different types of pedagogies, and then therefore technologies that are appropriate for them, then you can start to have a, an a, approachable design task, which is how can I build an interrelated set of these four or five kinds of activities that can be useful for, for um, a, a, given a, a given instructional environment on campus or course. Uh, and so that's what one of the things, uh, the group that I'm in, OEIT, uh, Office of Educational Innovation and Technology, um, has four uh, experiment spaces, one of which we're using for project-based learning right now. The one that you saw with the microscale engineering is one of our spaces. So it's designed to have a living room space off to one side, which is a big, huge U-shaped couch that's built, it's sort of like a bench seating in a, in a, in a large living room, which has projection and a place for students to, to talk to one another, but mostly for talking either across one another in an interactive sense or presenting in a small group. Then you have individual stand-up uh, bench height microscope experiment spaces. And on the side of the room furthest away, you have a sort of a prep area um, and lots of storage. The storage is the thing we usually overlook, actually. Um, that is one model for a small, uh, small base project learning environment. And I think the, the notion here is optimizing these limited sets of combinations. The real challenge is not ours, it's in the registrar's side of things. Because the reality is we've built a system where a faculty member expects room 101 for the duration of the semester, right? And the idea that they might, in fact, move across multiple spaces is a tough one. Scheduling-wise, it's a tough one. Infrastructure-wise, et cetera. There are certain things that go ar around in these spaces, though. If there's a surface that you can write on, it ought to be able to capture what's written. I mean, no matter where it is, so that you have a record of that. There ought to be spaces where everything in it is recordable if you choose. Because how do you do playback to discuss what happened in a particular interaction if you can't recover what just happened? 
there are certain things that I think are pervasive sort of givens that we're slowly getting to. Certainly the amount of disk space we can now uh, store and such, it makes more sense to record than it does to decide what to record. And we can throw away the stuff that we don't want later. Um, but there are certain sort of technical pervasive issues that I think are starting to come around in these environments. Any other questions? One more. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, that's my general sort of uh, a fear slide about the questions coming at me. <laughs> Right, this is, this is so that I'm the guy in the white shirt that's out here, and the, and the, and the fusillade is coming from the audience. But, uh, yeah. But uh, it's, it's tongue in cheek. Thank you very much.